Jason, thanks for coming, man. It is uh, Monday at 1. Wait, it's uh, Friday, right? <laughs> Friday at Cheers, 5. Cheers, my man. It's Friday at 5, we swear. <laughs> uh, appreciate you coming, man. So we have a pretty easy going setup. We try to have fun and uh, really just talk about uh, sometimes we'll get into life. Sometimes we'll talk real estate, whatever. We're uh, both big fans of Joe Rogan. Nice. So we uh, we love how they go about doing that, and it seems like a lot of fun, too. So nothing major, man, but we would love to uh, get into maybe a little bit of your background and just talk real estate, talk life, uh, see what you have going on. So if you're cool with it, we'd love to kind of start from the beginning. Yeah. Um, um, Jason Herbert I'm with uh, Lone Depot, and um, been in the business going on 20 years now. Wow. Um <laughs> Fell into the uh, business by accident, um, have a degree in biology, and my buddy's mom needed an assistant as I needed a job out of college, and 20 years later, I'm still here doing this crazy, uh, fun job. And this was in California? Yeah, this is uh, pretty much born and raised in San Diego, Uh, loved it out there, never thought I would leave, and had a family and sort of realized like everything that we truly wanted for our family wasn't really in San Diego, or at least we couldn't give it to our kids the way the same way that we really wanted to. So we sort of uh, said, well, what the heck, let's give uh, Austin a shot and uh, moved out here two and a half years ago now. Well, yeah. What did you, uh, what did you want to do with biology? Uh, originally, so I have a background in marine biology. I actually lived in a little island for a whole semester doing marine biology research, and I was really into genetics. Um, just because I liked uh, studying that type of stuff, because uh, had some, you know, a lot of people in our family has gone through cancer and things like. I was like, oh, I'm going to be the person to find the cure. And then I realized by the time I got through college, I'm like, that's a lot more stuff that's not really that interesting to me. <laughs> and so I was like, but I'm going to finish up my degree, and I just sort of, I'm a numbers guy, so I was actually going to go get my master's in statistics, and then numbers and loans sort of go hand in hand together. So it's sort of been a good combination for me. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a blessing then, huh? Cause yeah. you were losing a little bit of interest in biology and then she said, Hey, come work in the mortgage industry. Yeah, pretty much. I ran into her. My, my friend had just moved back to Michigan where he's from and ran into her like at a convenience store. And she's like, Hey, what are you doing? I'm like, this is what I'm doing. And she's like, come work with me. I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah. This is sort of one of those simple things that no clue what a mortgage was, knew no clue about anything. And uh, within like a year and a half, I was off, uh, wasn't originating or wasn't assisting her anymore. They put me in as an internal loan officer for Countrywide back in the day. I was closing 100 loans a month for them at one point. So I learned Dang. like how, how to get loans closed pretty quickly. So what, uh, what year did you start? About 2000, no, oh geez, two. So, 2002? Yeah. Okay, so we're almost 20 years now, yeah. So was it the uh, mortgage industry and the real estate industry at that time? It was coming out of dot-com and on the up? Yeah, it was, uh, rates were what they, a lot of people consider were really good then at like 5 and 6%, and everybody's like, oh, this is amazing. You had the implementation of stated income loans started to come through in like 2003. So then it just, the next like four or five years, yeah, was just basically getting loans in as quick and fast as you could and clean them closes. Like, I mean, I, I back in the day, I used to be able to get a call at 6 a.m. and close it the same day. Mm-hmm. Um, needless to say, this probably a part of the reason why. Closed and, closed and funded? Uh-huh. Same day? This is the time period that we missed out on. <laughs> yeah, it is. We would have loved this. Oh, it is. <laughs> Yes. I, and I dream about those days now because we're so, the regulations, and honestly, it's been a good thing. The amount, I wouldn't, maybe not to the extent of the regulations and all the timelines and stuff, but I feel like the market, like you don't, there's no more stated income loans. There's no more fog and mirror, all that stuff. It's like, you got to prove that you qualify for a home and that you earn a sufficient money to make your payments and things like that. And it, we're not just putting everyone in a house because, like, <clears throat> here, you're not going to get a million-dollar house when you make $20,000 a year. And theoretically, if you had a down payment before, you could do that. And What is this stated income loan? Uh, stated income is where you used to basically state whatever income you th- you thought you earned. State your income, get a loan. <laughs> <laughs> 
the same you, day. If you had a pulse, you got a loan. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was just one of those things where you're like, yeah, you could, even military people could buy a house, which you can go verify their income on the internet. Like, puts public information if you know their rank and their time frame, and they can state that they make 15 grand a month. And me as a loan officer has to put what they put on the state on the application. So how many times did you receive stated income loan applications and you were like, eh, he's probably not telling the truth, but hey, closed and funded. Oh, Lord. Um, Every time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I would just say that um, back in the day, it was plentiful. Most I, And the funny part was it was encouraged by the industry because the industry was giving you better pricing on those loans than they would on a full doc loan. That's crazy. And it's absolutely But insane. if you think about it, it's, at least from my understanding, it's a stated income loan, so there's a reason you're not doing the other type of loan. So it would maybe be a, a big percentage of the people that were... Yeah. Well, even like your W-2, A paper, high credit worthy people, I mean, it was the system would allow you to go that way. You'd get better pricing uh, to go that way. And yeah, I mean, it was just, I mean, it was probably like 80% of the business that was going through. It's at least through my desk and my branch and area that I was working through. It was just a nature of the beast, unfortunately, back then. Can you explain uh, the mortgage industry a little bit um, as much as you can and just your experience? Because uh, I don't fully understand it. And so um, and what I'm referring to is like how you as a broker, how you get paid. And you said a minute ago that the industry pays better on those loans. And so when I come to you for a loan, um, you know, how do you, the broker, get paid? Where does that loan come from? Um, and kind of how does it work, I guess, in a nutshell? Uh-huh. Um, okay, so there is a couple different like mortgage divisions you might want to say. So there's like a wholesale mortgage broker. Um, they are sort of you own your own shop, self-employed type people, and they have the ability to sell or originate loans for multiple wholesale department for all these different companies. So they get to shop for rates at all these different companies. Um they in turn have their commissions typically is built into most interest rates. That's pretty much an industry standard, but they do have the ability to charge points a little bit more and then make those as commission. So Um, when you say interest rate, so each time someone pays interest, the bank gets their portion broker gets a portion. No. So the way that it works is so when you close a transaction, you, like for me, I'm actually not on the wholesale side. I'm on the retail side. So I have like a set commission structure with my company. So I get a certain percentage of the loan amount, regardless of what the rate terms or whatever are. Um, so that's how my commission is derived. So just a quick, easy example, $100,000 loan. If I make 1%, I'd get a $1,000 commission. Um, that's all built into the rate sheet. And I don't have any way of adjusting it to... Regardless of the loan amount size, the difficulty of the loan or type of loan, those are and that's all part of the regulations nowadays. To where they're keeping because back in two thousand four or five, you had people that were charging all these excessive points and making two or three points on a deal, which on a hundred thousand dollar loan would be like three thousand dollars a commission, which is excessive uh, in many people's eyes, which I agree. Um, and they're not always looking out for the client's best interest. So for me, it's like I've got a certain percentage no matter what. So I'm always going to try to give my client the best product and rate that I can that's going to suit what their financial goals are. Short term, long term. Those are all type of things that I sort of take into consideration when I'm talking to my clients. And the uh, the point or the commission that the broker gets paid, does the bank pay that at closing? Do you get paid at closing? No, I get I get my I'm a W two employee, so when the, when they generate the I don't know exactly when they generate the revenue on the back end of it. Uh, I'm assuming it's when they sell off the note to Fannie or Freddie because a lot of our stuff is sent to them directly. Um, but they pay me as a W two employee twice a month, so I like I earn this commission now. I get it paid on my next pay period accordingly. Gotcha. But the bank does take that loss day one. Essentially, the bank that's loaning out the money. I would, yeah, because I mean, yeah, they're they're or fronting the money. They're fronting the money from probably their warehouse lines and things like that. Um, 
per se versus or their own personal money, depending on the institution. Uh, but yeah, they're putting all that money up until they transfer the servicing and get their revenue gen- generated. And so, um, sorry, I interrupted you. You oh. said wholesale. All right. Yeah. And then I'm retail and that's actually the field that I'm in. So like, I only work for one place. I work for Loan Depot. I only do loans for Loan Depot. Um, so like when we, everything's done through us, we underwrite in house, all that type of stuff versus like the wholesaler who has all the different options, but they have to send everything out to those different institutions to have things done. Um, each place has their own guidelines. Each place has positive and negatives. So th- assuming there's good, the good broker, they'll put it where the right place to get the best terms and the best underwriting for that scenario. Cause you do, uh, obviously every borrower has their own little quirks and unique things. And you guys got to make sure you're putting it at the right place. If you're in that type of that line of work. Do you know uh, what the mortgage industry is as a whole, uh, dollar amount, what the mortgage industry is? Oh, goodness. Honestly, no, but I'm sure it's got to be, I mean, our company funded over $3 billion last month. So, and we're, I mean, we're the fifth largest in the nation. I'm guessing you probably out of there, you've got to be close to a trillion dollar industry. I mean, it's, it's insane. I mean a lot of a month or a year a, 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 wait a, a trillion dollars a year i'm guessing i yeah. mean a, especially in the current this is probably 2020 is going to be a historic year for mortgages um the purchase business has been absolutely thriving and the refi business because of these historic rates has just been um just very bountiful to put it nicely <laughs> that was very interesting i mean ever since i was a little kid i always wanted to be a bank I always knew that the banks controlled the world and uh, (laughs) that if you were, you know, if you're out there loaning money to the masses, um, that was likely a good spot to be in if you were doing it right. Yeah. It's always good to be the person with the money. (laughs) Yeah. Or collecting it. Yes. Is it the banks control the world or women control the world? (laughs) In my I, household, it's definitely the women. <laughs> Mine too. I think I think it's the banks, but it could be the women inside the banks. There you right. go. The women are running the banks. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's good. It's good questions, Alex. Um, uh, you know, is there any th- like, what are the the inside information that realtors can know about lenders or banking that that can make us be better? Are there any like sophisticated? nuggets or tips or is it pretty straightforward i mean the industry has gotten a lot more straightforward than where it was five six years ago or even 2010 11 when everything was extremely regulated things have gotten easier per se for more borrowers to be able to qualify they've loosened things up to where it's a more common sense underwriting and things like that nowadays um I mean, truly, I think it's just making sure your clients are pre-approved up front. I think that's the most important part. And it's not just a pre-qual where they're like, oh, we filled out an application online. They said we're approved. I mean, I'm really having somebody review the income and the assets up front. That's probably the most important thing because as much as I trust my borrowers because everybody tells you the truth, it doesn't always add up on the paperwork, especially when you come to self-employed borrowers. They're like, oh, we make xyz money like oh that's amazing and then they're like oh well i also write this 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 and this off and they're like which i get i would do the same thing if i was self-employed i'd take as many deductions as i can and all of a sudden they're like oh wow you may show gross five hundred thousand dollars a year but you're only netting 10 grand in income we really can't that's only a little less than a thousand dollars a month to give you or uh, for income but it's not going to buy you a whole lot unfortunately Hey, it's, that's like the biggest thing I tell um, agents wise when it comes to lending is just get a full approval because I mean it's that's the most important part because a piece of paper is a piece of paper if it doesn't have any truth behind it. What yeah. percentage or how often do you see people that you know want to move forward and get a contract and and then they just can't get the loan? Does that happen often? Um, it honestly depends on the referral source. So if you're getting people that come from the internet, you get a lot of more people that are looky-loos, I'd say, you know, sort of like, oh, let's see what I can qualify. 
for um, you'll try you'll tend to have a lower approval rate. Um, if after I, they have a contract in place. Oh no no. Okay. Like, I'm just geez. curious because I've I've never had a buyer that like just couldn't get the loan at the end of the day, and I'm curious if that happens often or it's like I would hope not. I mean, if you're right, if you're putting a full, if you're writing offers, you better be pre-approved, and you better. I mean, I think over the years. Unless somebody loses a job or there's something traumatic that influences their financial position, I mean, there's you should have like a 99% close okay, rate. Okay, so like, it's really rare. Yeah. I, I mean, I've had people quit their jobs before the day before closing. Or people uh, <laughs> getting a, a line of credit the day before closing or buying a car. Yep. Those are all things that uh, could make things a little bit more difficult doesn't always disqualify them but it definitely uh makes everything scramble to try to re-approve them because now you have new debt new a new scenario basically Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. i read something the other day on uh, facebook it was from an agent who got a text from his client it was like a couple days before closing and it said hey bro i'm uh i'm i'm good to close i just got a a line of credit that'll cover my down payment (laughs) Yeah, I there's those are like that's really on the LO's job to have those conversations up front. Like, hey, this is like things you do not do while you're in contract. Like, you do not take out new credit, you don't go buy new things, do not open credit cards, anything like that. That's like part of our job as lenders is to educate people to make sure that because buying a house is obviously an important investment, but it's just, it's a huge transaction and you don't want to put their money or anything at risk. So like I take it personally that I always try to make sure I have those conversations with my clients because I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, I mean, if I can't deliver a loan, regardless of whose fault it is, there's probably something I could have done differently to make sure that loan went through either coaching the client on something like that or just, I mean, other than like somebody getting fired from a job, I mean. What are some what are some typical do's and don'ts? Because I personally don't have a, a mortgage in my name. <laughs> They're all through Matt's name because I'm that person who gets five hundred thousand in income and you know on paper it says ten. Um, <laughs> I'm taking it for the team on that one. <laughs> so I'm just curious. Uh, what are some some do's and don'ts? Uh, from basically, I always tell my clients once you get pre-approved um, and try not to don't go buy new furniture in the middle of escrow or apply for new credit cards don't go buy a new vehicle um if you're going to change a job tell us i mean there's i mean everybody you get an opportunity from the, like the time that you get pre-approved to finally finding your house especially in this market that's tough to get into escrow on um things change a little bit and just tell us talk to us before doing anything um because yeah it, Definitely, I've had a person, oh, I took a lease out on an $800 a month lease that was not in their budget. Um, so that changed their whole financial scenario it's completely. It's like sit still until closing. Oh, yeah. No, it's like, you always get the question, like, can I go buy furniture yet? <laughs> if you want to go pay cash and you we have plenty of assets to close, yeah, go pay, go buy furniture. Do not go take out that interest-free uh, 18 months no payment from... XYZ, Ashley Furniture, or wherever is offering some crazy special. Don't do it until after we close, please. <laughs> what about, do you, would you say that um, it's more important to just communicate? Because some people probably could go buy that new couch, right? I mean, is it is it a blanket rule, or is it all about debt to income? Um, obviously, I say it's sort of a blanket rule in the sense of it, try not to do any of that because if you do this at the last second then it's all more additional documentation that we're going to have to get that's going to delay your closing. It may not prevent you from buying a house. We delay closing. That could put your contract in jeopardy and where the seller could cancel. You have Uh, to re-underwrite the loan. Correct. Each time. Yep. New job, new loan, new... You have to re-underwrite it. So Jason, he's like, come on, man. I just did this. I, it's not, and it's not like in, typically people don't go from like, oh yeah, I got my hundred thousand dollar job and I just went over to a two hundred thousand dollar a year job. Here's my new pay stub, all that type of stuff. It's never like that. <laughs> the job starts in three months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and um, or the other thing is you find out uh, people are going to retire in a short period of time. Like that can always bring up a thing that because uh, we 
take your income that you've earned for the last couple of years and we project it forward. So now all of a sudden, if you're announcing or your company states that you're going to be retiring in a short period of time, that could put things in jeopardy. So just, just out of curiosity and uh, does totally hypothetically, you know, speaking <laughs> here, but uh, do y'all go and I would never do this, but do y'all go on, <laughs> on the W2? So like, for example, uh, if I, you know, bumped Matt and I's salaries up to, you know, $950,000 a year and we paid ourselves that for one month, could I come to you with these pay stubs and say, hey, here's my income? If you had no ownership in the company, yes. If I had no ownership? Yep. If you have ownership in the company, you then have an interest in... But we have to get the business tax returns and things like that. So then we would average out your W-2s for the last couple of years because it's self-employed borrowers. If you own 25% or more, <clears throat> you're considered owner of a company. Um, we have to get business finance or business returns and everything for that. Um, as much as you're paying yourself a salary and may want to bump it up to qualify for a new mortgage, that may not be a true picture of your company's w- ability to pay you. So we're going to look at, yeah, the whole scenario. And then something like that, we're going to look at your past and average it out. We're not Mm. going to be able to just give you an instant, oh, yeah, here, you make $30,000 a month. You can go buy this beautiful house over here. But But if, if, uh, I'm just curious, kind of like, because it seems as if it's uh, like, here's our guidelines as long as, and not you specifically, but just lenders in general. It's mm-hmm. like, here's our guidelines. You fall into our guidelines. We, you know, you got the green light. So <clears throat> say it wasn't me, say it was my girlfriend. And I said, hey, bring you on to our company for, you know, a month. We'll pay you this salary. If she submitted those, would it work out like that under the... If she was a new hire and she had two years of experience in the same line of work, same industry, same type of that we could establish, and she got a new job. We're going to use that new job income, um, either working for you, working for yeah. Make it, if it was a girlfriend, if it was a spouse, those those definitely get gray waters there, um, and where it's family business, and those definitely have a little bit different guidelines. But if it's like a completely outside company, I've had com- I've I've had clients that have switched jobs, and yeah, they. There, here's my new job. We're making I'm making fifty grand more a year. Day one, we give them that fifty thousand dollar more income because they're it's a new job, salary going forward. If they're part time, that's a whole different world, and that wouldn't ever work. With I, th- I think what it is. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there is guidelines and there is a system, but it's also people logically thinking about this on the backside, right? Like, yes. does, does this if makes you, if you <laughs> state your income. Yeah, back, yeah, we missed out on that. One. But, but am I We're right? Fast like, and easy days. I mean, you 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 are put it, the way I kind of view it is there's these guidelines, but it's like if you and I, Alex, are on the other side of this, we're gonna ask questions about, you know, what are the logistics? How does this work? Just like maybe you would be that all right. come into play, right? Like you, you, people may is that right? I mean, people may think that you're just dealing with a computer system, but you're dealing with human brains also that are right. understanding and have probably seen everything in the book. That's yeah. tried to run past them. 100%. I mean, as much as this is a technology computerized mm-hmm. world, and our files, for the most part, are always going to be touched by a live human that is going to approve a file and it's going to validate income. And it's going to, common sense, as much as I say is not in this industry, it's gotten a lot more back into it. Um, and it's, following the guidelines and using your best interpretation of those guidelines to make the things work as best as possible. Right. I guess it depends on your broker uh, <laughs> because I would say that my argument to that would be 2007 and eight where um, it's like state your income. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, or uh, you know, it's like, you know, part-time job earning $12 an hour. Of course we'll sell you your eighth house. You know, we'll fund you on that. You're right. But I think at least from what I've understood, because I, started getting into the real estate business in 2012, started trying to buy properties in 14 and 15. And for me, it was a nightmare to buy a house because I didn't have the two years, but I had perfect credit. I had money. And so I guess my experience was like, you're right. But I think things have changed for good 
from that. Like, it seems like people have learned their lesson and we're never going back to that. Okay, I'm not, it's definitely not going to say never. Uh, there is companies out there that are doing stated income, stated asset loans. They are non-QM, which is a non-qualified mortgage, which means basically they have a private investor that's backing these loans. They're not sellable to Fannie, Freddie, Jenny, who are the big government investors that basically fund all these loans because no company could hold on to billions and billions of dollars of loans. Um, those type of companies, you're not getting either that product is out there. It's like a 60% loan to value rates are horrible. I mean, they're probably, I'm guessing eight, 10% and you're not getting very favorable terms compared to a gray, like an a paper loan that you're going to get through me. Um, <laughs> but I mean, those products are out there. Well, yeah, and you're right. I mean, cause, but that's like where hard, I've been driven to hard money. Like I think, yeah. Anytime there's like private money, like there's anything's a possibility at that mm-hmm. point. But the normal, you know, four at least now three four percent interest rates. Right. Why do I'm still on the twos? What are you talking about? <laughs> there you go. Come on. <laughs> we're we're getting, we got we're all investment property. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then you those yeah. are the threes. Then yeah. Uh, Fanny, I'm happy with fours too, though. Yeah, fours are great as well. When we're coming down from ten, um, we were we, yeah because we, we did hard money. We bought hard money. Because we had to right. 10% down, refi at a higher price, cash out. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, to get into those type of properties, that's what you had to do. And it makes a lot of sense. You just got to obviously budget accordingly. And right. that, obviously, you guys are smart about stuff like that. But try to be. <laughs> um, back to mortgage education. Yes. So, Fanny, Freddie, and Jenny, um, why do they uh, buy these loans? Um, you just said that no company. So they, so they are giant funds. Uh, at one point, were uh, private and are now, uh, with the whole crash, uh, were acquired through the government by the government to prevent them from just completely going under because we had so many loans that were defaulted on. Um, so they were basically. I mean, we need somebody to be able to have, who has a large enough bankroll to fund all these type of uh, loans. So that is sort of their purpose, and at this point, they're government-controlled and regulated, at least. There's a couple of interesting things. So, like, <laughs> I mean, they're a public company. They're owned by the government, but they're public. Yeah. They're, like, massively profitable, and their stock trades at, like, $2. And it was like, if they ever were to go private, I mean, they were back in the, they were, the bubble. They were trading at $70, $80, $90 a share. Like, it doesn't make sense, the, the share price for what business model they have, but they're owned by the government. And my opinion is that, and I don't necessarily know why, but the government wants to sponsor and support home ownership. That's why these programs are put in place right. to allow people to buy homes at these prices, right? Yes. Because nobody has the money to give you a 3%, 2% interest rate. But so say, you know, Matt and I owned a mortgage company and you bring us a client, we, you know... If you were a wholesale, I guess, Mm -hmm. broker, right? You bring us a client, uh, we accept it, we fund it. Then we would turn around and sell this loan to Fannie, Freddie, or Ginny? As long as it meets their guidelines, yeah. I mean, that's That's, what most... Even your banks do that that because nobody can hold all that, has that much deposits that could hold all that. Um, And it's just an off-source. They'll hold on to the servicing. So you, it's all done behind the scenes. So the company may sell your servicing to another company or, but a lot of companies are now holding on to servicing rights as they're starting to get more and more valuable um, is basically, yeah. So you just keep making your payment. You'll get a notice in the mail like, oh, by the way, your loan was sold to Fanny or Freddie. Basically to you, you just keep making your payment to the same company that it tells you to keep making your to payment the same to. same loan servicer. Yeah. But uh, Fannie, Freddie, whoever, um, these government institutions, when they're buying these loans, I mean, uh, I got a couple questions there. So do I reach out to Fannie and Freddie or are they actively? That is, so that's definitely outside. That's a whole different department than what I'm used to. I'm on the originating side. Uh, My understanding is basically everything is packaged and like, I mean, so basically... I don't want to say package like back in the day, but like basically you're like, okay, we have X, Y, Z's at, we have $5 million that we committed to sell to them at 
a rate of 3% or whatever. So then they're delivering a package like that. That is like my very, very minimal, minimal knowledge on that. I, that, that part of the world is like... It's but like, that's why you're so... That's why they're so stringent on do these meet the guidelines. Yes. Because they know that they can sell it to them no matter yeah. what. Pretty much, right? Right. Like and you don't want to be stuck with it. Yeah, because what happens if those guidelines... If they audit a file and pull a file and find loans that aren't... That don't meet those guidelines, they make the company buy those loans back. And the companies then have to carry those loans on the books. But so I'm just trying to understand, uh, I guess, the whole system just from a macro level. Um, but uh, and just any any insight is is great. And so Fannie and Freddie and these government and Jenny, these institutions, they buy these loans um, that meet their criteria. Um, are they paying, you know, dollar for dollar? Are they paying or over what the bank like? How is the. Uh, the value of the bank is having this, you know, performing note, right? right? And so where are they making their money by selling it to Fannie and Freddie? By going and getting more points, by closing more loans? Are they selling them at a discount to Fannie and Freddie? Honestly, I don't have a great full knowledge of that part. My understanding is like, so you have mortgage-backed securities that are, we'll say we're trading for X amount of dollars, and when they sell it, they have like, and that's all like sort of what our rate sheet is. They have the company when they're selling or put our rate sheet together, they have all the revenue that they want to earn on a loan built into the rates. So they sell it. So when they sell it to once the loan's funded, they sell them in these packages, they're selling them with X amount of profitability built into them based off the what terms that they were able to sell. I'm not sure if that really makes sense because yeah. I'm not sure. Well, I don't fully understand that portion of it. Back to the government wanting to, you know, support home ownership. I don't think, and the way I understand it, that Freddie and Fannie, they're they're not really trying to like make money and run this massive profitable business. They're just trying to help everything work. And well, ultimately, right. we're like it's owned by the government, so taxpayers are are ultimately mm-hmm. paying for that, right? No, I get it, I, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm just curious uh, how it all, how it all. Yeah, works dude, together. I was buying the stock <sighs> back. I was buying the stock in college whenever everyone thought it was going to go private, I would and hope, it just blew up because it's it's so weird that it's. I mean, they have a stock symbol, mm-hmm. and they make like billions of dollars, but their market cap is I, I, who knows? It's a couple hundred million. That's yeah. I mean, I would hope that these that Fannie, Freddie, and Jenny are not losing money, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, when everything collapsed, they obviously that whole they were in a lot of trouble. Needless to say, but I mean, I think now with things being done in a more regulated, more just truthful manner of the people qualifying and earning the right to buy the home. Um, it's just created a better product for them to buy, a more sustainable product. Um, you're just you're not having the foreclosures and those. Type, uh, I got to imagine the rates foreclosure rates are significantly less nowadays than they were obviously ten years ago when everything was just disappearing or mm-hmm. foreclosing on it seemed like. I was just trying to meet Freddie Mac and get some money from him. <laughs> and Fanny. <laughs> and Fanny. <laughs> Does she have a daughter? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm truly interested. I mean this is uh I don't think I ever have sat down with uh you know a mortgage broker other than Tommy um and talked, you know, loans and um uh, you know, I, I'm fascinated and I have and I love looking at the economy as a whole. And obviously, uh, you know, the, the flow of money is what is controlling everything. And so another one of my questions, too, was, um, you know, like coronavirus hits or 2008 hits and, uh, you know, either fiscal uh, policy is talking about um you know, lowering interest rates. The Federal Reserve says, hey, we're going to drop interest rates. And they just had another meeting, I think, last week. They said they were going to keep them, you know, the same rate. Mm -hmm. Um, Two, you know, encourage, you know, more loans, businesses borrow more money. However, um, it seems that when that happens, banks are not too eager to loan out money. Um, Therefore, kind of of, uh, prohibiting or, you know, restrictions get tighter and tighter and therefore, not as much money is being lent out. Um, 
And so I was just kind of curious. Uh, I'm just fascinated by the whole thing. And you're talking, I think you're talking community banks, right? Uh, not sp- well, I mean, because I sort of, I mean, I sort of disagree with what you're saying about the ability to lend money. I mean, it's easy. Well, I mean, with Corona, yes, we had a, they tightened up on guidelines, but I would say we've probably already reduced of like all the guidelines that got added, probably 80 for 80% of them or what they say is other oh, overlays, probably 80% of those overlays are now gone. I mean, um, I don't feel like it's that tough to get a loan nowadays. That, I mean, that's what I said. With I, so, so I wasn't really talking about mortgages. Okay. Um, just about like business loans. Oh, okay. or, that, those are a whole different animal. And yeah, I, unfortunately I'm been a W2 retail loan officer my whole career. So like I, as much as I've, done loans for self-employed people. I've never ventured into having to get a business loan or anything like that on my end. Um, yeah. So that, my knowledge is <laughs> business loads, uh, commercial loads are very, very limited. I'm a retail. Well, why is it? Guy. I mean, I think that's a good thing that you yeah. do that. Is it strategic on, you didn't want to get spread too thin and you want to stick to this niche and just be really good at that? Um, Cause I'm sure people ask you all the time for all kinds of loans, yeah. which lenders, Probably venture out to start doing those loans. Yeah. I, mean, I don't I, have thoughts one way or another. Just. No, I just, um, as being a retail lender, I've always only able to do residential. So it's one to four units, single family, condos. Those are like residential stuff. Um, anything over four units uh, uh, is considered commercial. And typically every company I've worked for just doesn't do it. Um, it's a whole different animal, different way of qualifying um just nothing that i've ever got into um and just yeah so it's just uh, it's a whole different sure and it's funny when i actually was moving out here to from san diego i was like just trying to figure out exactly i was i was gonna stay in the lending world i found i saw somebody advertising for a commercial lending position paying a salary job i'm like wait salary that sounds sort of good um but they're like you have no background i'm like i'm a numbers guy i know how to trust me you I can figure out how to do commercial lending. I understand. I mean, uh, how to put a like qualifying with, I don't know, income based qualifying off the property versus qualifying as a business, those type of things. He's like, dude, you actually know what you're talking about, but I can't hire you. I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, so, I mean, it was just sort of a long shot that I sort of threw it out there. It was really like looking at it. Cause I mean, I still do a lot of my business out in San Diego because I spent, a ton of years out there just building my relationships and have uh, been able to hold on to a, quite a few of them. That's and, awesome. Uh, just family, friends, and just uh, my real estate referral partners out there. So I would imagine the San Diego mortgage market would be better for you than, I guess, the Austin mortgage market. If we're talking about, you know, like that 1% off of yes, principal. Yes, but Austin is catching up in a hurry. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm based... My loan amounts on average are a lot larger in San Diego just because the average sales price out there is higher. But the way the market is going out here, <laughs> it's and it's a little scary on how fast, like especially this last year, it's uh, the values have just really skyrocketed out here um, to where, I mean, your $400,000 homes out here, is, it's not hard to find those or to do loans on properties with those size loans now. Mm-hmm. Um, my average loan, I think last year where I'm, did probably 80% of my business out in San Diego was over 500. So, I mean, yeah, obviously the, for me, it's like, yeah, the larger the loan, larger commission, that's great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, the business, the market out here is catching up to San Diego. I mean, and both these cities, I don't know, for me, mimic each other a lot. Like, I feel like Austin's sort of like 20 years behind, San Diego, maybe growth wise and things like that. Cause when I grew up there, like all this, I feel like that's sort of how Austin is right now. And it's just same type of growth and desire to, of a place to live like San Diego does. I mean, and so what, um, you'd mentioned that you and your family decided to move to Austin recently. Um, and so what was that and decide why Austin, Texas? Honestly, it was about as close to San Diego, inside Texas that we could find. I mean, it was, it's just, it's a great city. It's, it's fun. It's very, very family forward, which is what we were looking for. Um, it's just 
I mean, honestly, it's just a great place to raise a family, and that's truly what we were looking for. We don't have the ocean, but we have rivers, so we got a boat. Uh, we can go floating. I mean, it's, I know there's you can still do water activities out here. You can go camping. I don't know. Um, have you been to uh, the coast? No, I have not been to the coast yet. I was curious what, <laughs> what your opinion on it would be if, uh, to be like, this isn't the beach compared to San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I do live in a new development, so I'd say like a third of our street are also from California. Um, and a, quite a few of them are like, yeah, it's a different coastline. It's not... I mean, I grew up in San Diego. It's one of the nicest beaches in the world. I mean, I'm sort of jaded when it comes to that type of stuff. But it's just, it's a different beach experience. But I mean, it's not like, I mean, my little kids, they're not going to know the difference. Why you got to knock it, Alex? I was just going (laughs) to tell everyone. Move to Austin. <laughs> I, no, I mean, it's, it's the greatest short... place in the world. I mean, and if you're a surfer, we got that. Uh, the wave park. The wave park. So there, there you go. go. We got wave I mean, parks. But I was just curious um, because, I mean, uh, I've never been to California. Um, and I've been to Florida and the places I've been. Well, I've actually been to your mom's or your grandma's place in Marco Island. That was really nice. That's probably the nicest place I've ever been. Florida's super nice beaches. But, but And he's right. I've been to San Diego. And. I, I'm I'm glad you said that because I went there and I was like, this reminds me of Austin. It was I mean, different, but it was it was very clean and yeah, it's very clean. I mean, San Diego is an amazing town. As much as uh, we moved away from it, it's still a great town. It's an amazing place to visit. It's just like I don't know. For me, it's just not the same place it was 20, 30 years ago. Jeez, almost forty years ago now, uh, when I was a little kid. And um, yeah, it's just. I, I don't feel you. like I just feel like the hustle bustle there. It's the energy there to us just wasn't what we were looking for anymore. Like here, it's like I feel like it's a thriving place, positive. It's not always about keeping up with the Joneses here. It's just about more wholesome. Yeah, and that's just more what we were looking for. And um, San Diego is awesome. I mean, it's stuff. We go back there, and like my wife and I are like, why do we leave this? And then you're like, but well, it's. Oh, there for a week is one thing. <laughs> there's a real thing, in my opinion, uh, when they say the vibe. Like, there's a real vibe here. Uh, we don't compare, in my opinion, by any means to California weather, all this stuff. I'm like, it's obviously way better there for those things. But the vibe, the business, you know, all that kind of stuff, that's why I'm here. Yeah, yeah I mean, this. I feel there's a lot of positivity here. I mean, California, I mean, they're the exodus out of California is pretty extreme and it just seems like it's getting worse and worse. Um, it's tough. I mean, it's a different, uh, corporate environment there. I mean, you pay a lot more taxes out there. You pay for, I always joked around that like, Oh, I pay for my sunshine tax out here. And like, don't get me wrong. San Diego, the weather is probably arguably, if not the best in the world. It's unreal. Dude. I it's mean, like it, every yeah. single day, it's like <laughs> 70, sunny. I mean, there's, I spent Christmas at the beach. I've, but yeah, I mean, like my beach. son's birthday, which is coming up, uh, it was like 100 degrees in November. Yeah. I mean, it was like, which was sort of insane. It was way hotter than we were expecting and sort of wasn't what ideally what we had set up for. But, I mean, yeah, you're you're complaining when it's 65 right. out there. You're, it's, Fucking the plants are thriving. <laughs> you look around like... These plants love it everywhere. Plants. What uh? <laughs> what county is San Diego in? Is it San Diego yeah, County? It's San Diego County. Where is that comparatively speaking to uh, Los Angeles County or Orange County? So Orange County butts up next to San Diego County, um, which is uh, San Diego is like I don't know, probably a hundred and fifty. I don't know, one hundred fifty miles or so off the the Mexican border, all the way up. Then you have Orange County, which then blends into L.A. County, and then you start getting things intertwining, sort of like how you have, like, Williamson, Travis here. Right. Well, the reason I asked is I was listening to uh, Joe Rogan last night talk about exactly what we're talking about, and he said that, um, you know, he was comparing L.A. County or Orange County to Austin, Texas here, and he was saying it's, you know, similar and in many ways, uh, except for the fact that here you're not so crammed in together. That in L.A. County or Orange County or San Diego County, there are just so many people living in the same area. And here it's the same thriving city, except you're much more spread out. Uh, there's just, I don't know, there's probably what, 
20 times less people in Austin than in LA? Probably. <coughs> I mean, like San Diego, I think is about 3 million people or so in the county. And we're what, rough, probably between Travis and Williams and what, a million and a half maybe? Yeah, almost two, yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's a lot more spread out. The public transportation, and especially in Southern California in general, is pretty horrible, in my opinion. If you go to other places of the world, in New York, Chicago, other just thriving big cities, their public transportation is a lot more dialed in. Um, They've already, uh, compared to what you see in Southern California, um, out here, I wouldn't say, I think everybody is pretty accessible via driving. I mean, don't get me wrong, the 35 downtown is not fun, but... That's all right. Elon's coming to town. Hey. Uh, this is more traveling. from California. Uh, yeah, I know. I always apologize to people when I tell them I'm from California because, like, I I really enjoy it out here. This I really enjoy this town. It just it connects with me a lot. And like, so I'm like, and then I'm like, I talk to people that have been here twenty, thirty years, grew up here, and I'm like, I get why they're like freaking out about all the Californians coming here and everything. And I'm like, I get it because I don't. San Diego was the same place that I grew up in, and why yeah, I left. It's a, I'm glad you and said like, that. Is like because I think this is just it's an amazing town, and I'm like I just I could sense the people like we we want to buy land and build like some nice house that I could put my parents and her parents on, and we're like holy cow, like that stuff's gone already. <laughs> like that's like San Diego. There's no land left in San Diego, right. and it's like it feels like it's just evaporating here so quickly too. You're right, but also like because I've thought about this a lot lately, and. I want as many people to come here as possible. Like, I love it for business. Right. Uh, but I think the problem, and this is what they were talking about on Rogan as well, is like, if you're coming from another area to maybe reconsider how you vote and view things, not necessarily like you have to stay the way that, you know, you have to convert, but like Texas is different from California in a lot of ways because of the politics. And it's not like I'm getting too political, but no. like, I think that meant, cause I always wondered like, cause I'm from here and it's like, why do people say like, this is my town? No one's welcome. I never really agreed with that. It's like, you're just born wherever you're born and who, right. who really gives a fuck. But when it starts changing because of voting and then it this d- becomes California in a vote sense, that could be the problem. I don't know. No, I well, 1 million percent know what you're talking about and have uh a lot to say on that. Not but that I'm like, just, it, it's not even that I, cause I'm not like, I'm in the mid, like I'm libertarian. I'm not like Republican a hundred percent, but right. I do believe in the way that we run businesses here. Ver, like nobody wants to be taxed. Like yeah. what you're saying in California. Like, well, I earn my money. I want to keep it. I, right. I, want, I don't need it to fund things that I don't think are necessary. Right. Like I, I don't, I don't think it's a reasonable request to, uh, I don't think you can have both. I don't think you can have people move here from California or Oregon or wherever you you know they're coming from, and then say, "All right, when you get here, now we need you to change the way you've thought about things your entire life." Well, but and here's the thing: this is what they're saying because, like, Rogan was meeting with the governor, and he's like, "You ju- you just want people to look in the mirror." There's a reason they're leaving these places. It's not right. just because it's it lost. just happened. Like the votes push them out. They don't agree with all the stuff. So why would you want to bring that same mentality here? Oh, I hear you. <laughs> I, oh, you're I, just I, saying it's not a reasonable... I, I understand Well, it's something completely. to think about. And I, it, I'm not like hardcore Republican. Oh, no, I vote for whoever is in a, who I think is going to best represent me. I don't care what party you are a part of. I'm going to like, I'm going to put my vote towards who I think is going to do the right thing and going to represent my views the best. Right. I mean, I'm a pretty open person... There's no right party, no wrong party. Like, I mean, it's just right now. I don't. I think it's just sad how divided the country's gotten, which is just Agreed. a shame. Like, that's like the biggest thing for me. It's like this is an like amazing country, and people forgot how amazing this place is. I've been fortunate to travel a little bit. I mean, I've been a few different places around the world, and this country. People forget that live here, especially the people that never traveled. That this is a people are trying to come here every day because. They're not, they don't have the opportunities that we have here. I mean, this is a place that you can do anything. You can build your an empire, make all this money, or you can just chill, be relaxed, and live a very humble life. I mean, this is a probably one of the few places in the world that you can do what you truly want. It's a freedom that we have here. 
And a lot of places just don't have it. And that's why people are trying to come here. Can and you expand on that a little that's bit? That's great. Because <laughs> uh, I've never lived anywhere else. I've only lived here in, in Texas. And in Austin, Texas, for 25 years, one of those years I lived in Fort Worth um, and hated it. I had to get back to Austin. But uh, so, I mean, I don't have a perspective of seeing California or another state or Anywhere else of not being able to do what I want, all I know is Austin, Texas. Um, all right, let's see here. I had, honestly, I never thought I'd leave California. There's no way in the world, if you'd asked me five years ago if I was leaving California, I would have said no. Why would I? It's amazing. It's great. Um, the politics there, I'm definitely not a big fan of their current governor. Um, and for me, it was just like, I couldn't f- afford, I mean, yeah, you pay a lot in taxes when you're just, and the way the tax rules were changing and things like that, it was just like, I'm going to keep less and less of my money there. And then every new bill that was voted on, if you put something tied to a school, it would pass. And the thing with the school is, yeah, we all want to support our schools, but they're adding, and this is politics in general in our country, is like, it starts out at one thing and this is what you want. But then there's 10 things attached to it that is not what you're looking for and ends up where all the money ends up going and not going to where it really should go. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see that with, uh, I think, like the state lottery systems. A lot of the money, like, oh, it's going to go to schools and go to schools, and it's still a small percentage of what it truly should Mm -hmm. go. I mean, um, so, I mean, yeah. So taxes. What about, so somebody I knew was telling me he moved here because of, like, he's like, they're so lawsuit happy. He was telling me there's these commercial. He got sued for somebody slipping, like faking like they slipped or something. I don't know the real story, but he's like, there's these commercials. If you think you may have been hurt or you, uh-huh. you think it was possible, give us a call. And he was said he's getting sued like hundreds of times. I don't know how big of a factor that is, but... Um, I wouldn't say that was a factor for us. I mean, I haven't heard, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the U S in general is pretty sue happy when McDonald loses a case because a person spilled hot coffee on them. And it didn't say the coffee was hot on the cup. I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's just a national thing nowadays where, I mean, you can get sued for anything and it's sort of a shame. It's like, just common sense doesn't apply to a lot of things nowadays and just our common decency. And that's um, an old example. Yeah. I'm I mean, curious to hear what the new examples uh, yeah. are. He, he just made it seem, you know, I don't hear about lawsuits happening often in here, uh, but he just made it seem like it was like a normal thing. Like he deals with four or five lawsuits every year. That's like crazy. That's, and that's, and that's honestly, literally why he moved here. He's like, I can't deal with this. See, I, I just assumed that was just a national thing per se. And I mean, that's also why I'm fearful and I'm glad I work for a company. And that's part of one of the things that I like rather work for a company because it's like, yeah, it's like you're a self-employed person. Did you're, you look at somebody nowadays and they get upset and they, you're liable to get sued for something. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous thing. Everybody, it is a sue happy world. It's all right. I mean, <laughs> they don't want to sue you when you don't own anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad you said. I'm glad you went on that little. I'll call it a rant about the U.S. because I think it's really important with with everything that's going on. Like I haven't heard that someone say that in a while. Oh. You're right. Like it's all. I've heard a lot of complaints, Dude. but you're you're totally right. We're in the best place in the world, and um, there's not a lot of reasons to complain if you live here. I mean, you're freaking won the lottery already. Yeah. No. It's honestly that's freaking extremely true. It's like. I mean, I've, we went, where'd we go? We just went to Cabo recently and like, yeah, you, all of a sudden you're, we're, it's a little drive from the airport to the main little touristy town and you're driving through and you see these towns and you're just like, okay, that like, that, that's a, that's a house. That's like a, barely a cardboard box. And those are people graze their kids in and do things. And it's like, we take so much for granted in this yeah. country and Dude. it's just, a, it's a shame because people have lost track of that. That's true. You're right. And I'll tell uh, two things, like that, in my perspective, because I've been to Africa and seen people oh, with wow. nothing. And and what I'll say about that is, like, I saw people actually a lot happier than they are here. So, you know, they knew, in my opinion, what was most important. I mean, these people were just very, all of them, they were all very, very happy. Uh, and I don't know the statistics, but I would imagine we have, like, a much higher suicide rate and all this wow. stuff here than, than there. And and the other thing was the lady that just came on our show, Christine, she was from uh, Vietnam and had to come over here on a boat when she was four years old, 
had nothing. Her parents didn't even speak the language. Now she owns three restaurants, multiple properties, has a hundred and something doors that she manages. Like that's, that's to the power. I mean, literally she came from nothing on a boat. That's awesome. You know what I mean? So like stories like that, I love them because it, it proves what you're saying to be true. Yeah. And I, the, you're going back to your happiness thing. That's like actually uh, something that definitely resonates with me. It's like, is uh, I was talking about, I did a trip to Australia before and like how they shut like the largest brewery there shut down at, three o'clock on a Friday and doesn't open back up till Monday morning. Why? Because they were, their focus is on enjoying life, not working to make money, mm-hmm. which is unfortunate. It's just part of a capitalism, American culture. I mean, yeah, it's, Where it's a grind. Uh, Australia. That was out in Australia. Brisbane. It's called four eggs brewery. If you're ever out there, you got to do a tour. It's absolutely hilarious. Same thing with Italy. That's their whole, uh, never been to Italy. I'd love to, but that's their whole mindset is, you know, something along those lines where they like, you know, don't start work till late and Sunday they sleep in, they drink wine and everybody gets together and they have their big, you know, whatever their culture is. Yeah. But just don't, ex- well, I don't go too political, but it's just, go ahead. you can't expect like Italy and other places, the, the government to support you and allow you to live that lifestyle. If you're not going to be able to work, like put the yeah. effort in to support it. But, like, going back to your Africa thing, like, I've had that conversation with my wife. I'm like, especially, like, the whole thing of COVID, you're just, like, I've been home a lot more. (laughs) I don't have an office to work in. So, like, you have those conversations where it's just, like, we do all this stuff. We're trying to do all this stuff for our kids. And I'm, like, just trying to keep them happy, fulfilled. And, like, yeah, you look at, like, countries like Africa where there's... they're living in the bush. They're doing things like that. They don't know technology. They may like some of these people may have never even seen a TV or anything like that. And how happy and enthusiastic they are about life. And it's like we wake up here. Typically, it's like okay, I got ten thousand things to do today. Just and hopefully they all go the right way. And it just it's the life is I think, it's a grind. I think it's, it's a, I think it's for many reasons. Because uh, I think that the people in Africa. For example, um, they don't have time to sit in self-pity about this or that or, you know, you wonder why they didn't get so many likes on their Facebook posts when yeah. this person got this many. I mean, it's about survival, right? And, uh, you know, I think, it, I think it comes from many things. And unfortunately, um, you know, the United States population suffers from a lack of this. And I talk to, to many people all the time that, you know, happiness comes from within and it doesn't come from, yeah. you know, this mm-hmm. office. It doesn't come from social media. It doesn't come from your job. You can be happy living under a bridge and the most content you've ever been in your life. Or, you know, same thing if you live in a million dollar mansion downtown Austin. Uh, it's all about you know, what you do internally and not what's going on externally. And like, but here you get the choice. Like you can go do the full capitalist thing or you can do the, huh? the Italian style. I mean, that's uh. the thing is you get, and the bridge that you're going to be living under here is pretty freaking nice. <laughs> yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, you're so, right. They don't have, that's, they literally don't have a choice. Yeah. And, and the other thing is like, when I noticed in Africa is like, you know, guys are tempted every day by sexual images and all this stuff. You don't, see, you don't, you don't have these things in Africa. Like they don't have a model on a billboard, you know, trying to drink a Coke and looking all sexual or whatever it may be. It's like, this is a different fucking world. And it was really magical. I was like, this is beautiful. You know, and but and and but being here, you get to, you can have both of those. So you can live that style too if you want to. And you can understand it at a whole different level because you have more access to more people and more thoughts and more cultures. You you can, um, but I think that it's much it's, better to do it there if you want to go. Full I, on. I don't I don't think you can escape it. You can have as much discipline that's, in the that, world. But that's what I was saying about the like, the billboards and the subliminal messaging. Oh, and yeah. It's all you know. Everyone you know in some circles, like the person with the more money is always feeling like they're in charge. And it's like, who gives a fuck about that kind of stuff? Yeah. No, I 100% so, agree with all that. It's like, you just got to Austin. Road, you, now, just, baby. you just <laughs> got to Austin. So now you're about to move to Africa. <laughs> my, my wife said to be in for a culture shock. Uh, no, yeah. Walk us through like, so you two, two, three years ago, you came here and like, 
what does it look like now? Uh, any any major goals or things that we can help you out with, or was even it, some of our listeners? Was it two years ago, or it was really recent, wasn't it? No, it was two years ago. Two years ago, August two thousand eighteen. So yeah, so I mean, we built our house. We did one of the new construction builds. Um, moved into that in May of last year. Um, love it. So I like going forward. I is. Is it true that lenders always get the best interest rates? <laughs> I do. What are you talking about? I don't know, I don't know which lenders you're talking to. What's the best rate you've ever seen? <laughs> um, I've quoted a person at 1.99 before. I, it was a 15-year, and they, yeah, I mean, it's... And here's my little two thoughts uh, on what's going to happen in 2021, regardless of the whole political aspect of things. I think that the way that the economics and everything that are currently going on and i'm sure they'll fluctuate a little bit but the right now rates should honestly be lower than where they're at uh mortgage companies are at over capacity and have been this pretty much whole year because there's just been so much business that they're just flooded and could only handle so much so what happens is company raise rates and it's an industry-wide thing where they've raised the rates so my gut feeling is that we're going to see Somewhere in the first half of next year. This is my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. But I think we're going to see lower rates beginning of next year than we do than we have this year. Uh, yeah, which is, here. <laughs> so when you <laughs> when you say Russian. when it's you beer. say that they're still uh, you know higher than they should be, is it because like you said they're just overworked? They have to keep them this high for capacity. Yeah. I mean, there's only so much. How many loans you can process in a month? Uh, I mean, I don't think there's any company that doesn't have their fulfillment teams working overtime constantly things like that um it's just one of those things where yeah it's just over capacity they just can only process so much and to slow things down typically you're like oh we'll raise rates well there's still even with raising rates rates are stupid historically low um and it's just one of those things where there's just a lot of business to be had the housing market is just thriving um People want them, especially out here in Austin. I mean, you just can't build a home fast enough. I mean, people are so many people are moving here. Like, it's just insane on, like, you can't even get... It's hard to find a house to be able to buy. So what do you think that they will uh, lower to? 1.99. I think you'll you'll see the 15-year in the ones. I think you'll see 30-year mid to low twos. And like no points. And I'm saying no points because I don't like when we, and points are basically upfront money you pay to buy down your interest rate. So um, I always like to quote everything just at that at zero points. I'm not big on fees. So I try to keep everything as cheap as possible. So And so when when rates drop down to, to those levels, um, what do you think that the ripple effect of that will be into other areas? Other is you mean other like nationwide areas, or are you talking just like local here in Austin? I or go up or I, nationwide. I it's just you're gonna see values keep going up. Um, in a lot of areas, I think more nationally, you'll probably see things flatten out more, just because I think there's only like prices can only get so high for certain areas. I mean, like San Diego. I mean, I think the, it's just insane on what houses are going for out there compared to like even five, six years ago. Um, But I mean, it all goes with, it also goes with like how much people are earning. Like keep taking their taxes. They're going (laughs) to, their money out of their paycheck. They're not going to be able to afford these expensive houses. So I'm curious about that because when you hear, like what I've started to learn about recently is like, obviously I know the media, you know, can influence you, but like you can hear what's happening in California and and think that there's it's it's a nightmare like what you're saying people moving here fires like it's easy to get in that but like prices are still going up is mm-hmm. that is that accurate i mean cuz you're talking about there is a mass exodus but prices are still just going up is that right 100% i mean it's as much as people are leaving california there's a lot of people still moving there um especially san diego i mean it's it's an amazing town there's i mean the weather there's still a tech industry there that's really strong. Um, so there's just a lot, pretty solid job market out there that are high paying net worth jobs. So, I mean, there's, it's, 
Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It's. And honestly, if you look at it, especially statewide in California, as a coastal community, a major coastal community, it's the most affordable still. Because uh, you look at it, you got LA that's more expensive, Santa Barbara, San Francisco, that whole section. The those are all. Yeah, I mean, those are all just California coasts that are more expensive than San Diego. And if, so if you look at it that way, San Diego's primed to even go up even more, which is. It's mind-boggling since I grew up there and my mom still lives there and everything like that, that what she could sell her house for. And I keep telling her to move out here, but she's law like <laughs> I'm like, you're going to miss the market out here. Like you're, but yeah. Um, I just think, I mean, I think the real estate market has got, especially and, and the one in Austin is just insane. Like there is this market, there's nothing that's going to slow it down in the sense of, I mean, it's not going to be economy proof, but I think, the demand to live here, the job growth and everything like that. This is probably the most, one of the stablest markets that you could look at. Um, I, I was talking to people cause obviously I wasn't here in 08, 09, 10, all that. Even when San Diego lost 50% of its value on properties out here, I think it was like a break even, maybe a little bit That's depending true. on your location and things like that. That's true. I mean, it's, and it's, you're just seeing like the growth out here is the demand out here is just, there's no stopping it at this point. Or Opportunity first, city, man. I, I mean, keep saying it. If I had them, if I had some, uh, what is it? Bitcoin laying around, I'd be buying some investment properties. <laughs> <left and right. laughs> right on, man. Well, Hey, uh, I know we all got to get back to the day. Um, really appreciate it. Is there any way that we or our listeners can add value for you? Um, how can people get a hold of you? Oh, all right. Yeah. My uh, cell phone, 760-715-3434. That's my cell phone. Call, text me anytime. Love an opportunity to earn your business. Uh, pretty straightforward person. Um, you can email me at jherbert, uh, J-H-E-R-B-E-R-T at loandepot.com. Um, those are the two quickest ways to get a hold of me. And, um, yeah, I mean, I help people out with purchases, refinances. Um, those are the two main things that I probably, nice. uh, we do do construction loans, but those are one-offs at this point for me. Nice. <laughs> it's not my niche product. I do a lot of VA business. Always proud to work with veterans. I think I got four of them in process right now, which is, that's awesome. I, I never was in the military. I look back at it now. It's sort of like something I didn't, wasn't able to do or wasn't sort of guided by my family to do. And it's like, this is like the least that I can do to help them out. Um, so yeah, that's cool, man. Well, awesome. appreciate that. Appreciate your time. Ah, thank you guys for having me in here. It's yeah. been fun. Cool. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time. Cheers.